So good afternoon and thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. My name is Melissa Loriano and I serve as the programs manager for the DC Preservation League. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with DCPL, we are a citywide nonprofit organization founded in 1971 who, um, and we're dedicated to the preservation and protection of the historic built environment um, of Washington, DC. So I'd first like to take a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one today. And they are Denton's, Douglas Development, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Buyer Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. So many thanks to you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. I'd also like to share a few brief notes about how our program is gonna to work today. So please use the Q&A box found on the bottom of your screen to ask any questions of our presenter. I will collect your questions um, and verbally ask them of our speaker at the conclusion of his presentation. And for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, DCPL's Director of Development, Kelly Knox, will be monitoring any questions you all might have and will pass those along to us as well. Okay, with that, I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's speaker. Alexander Padro is the Executive Director of Shaw Main Street, sorry, that was a tongue twister for a second, Shaw Main Streets, Inc. in Washington, DC, which received the Great American Main Street Award in 2016. Mr. Padro is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the Shaw neighborhood's commercial revitalization and historic preservation efforts. The organization has helped to attract over 3.5 billion in public and private investment to this commercial district, as well as over 400 new businesses. He has helped to found Shaw Main Streets and served as chair of the organization's board of directors before begin, uh, being asked to assume the role of executive director in 2004. He is a graduate of New York University and has been a corporate executive in the uh, publishing industry, as well as a small business owner. A Shaw resident since 1997, he has served 20 years as an elective advisory neighborhood commissioner and chairman of advisory neighborhood commission 2C, uh, 6E in Shaw. He is a board member for several nonprofits and, and advocates for preservation, affordable housing and the DC public library system. So with that, I will turn things over to Alex. Thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon, everyone. In 2003, when Shaw Main Streets uh, was founded, uh, we decided that it would be important to, uh, to record the transformation of the neighborhood uh, so that we could demonstrate the impact that we had had in terms of playing a role in planning and in promoting preservation. Unlike uh, some of the other Main Street organizations in Washington, D.C., Shaw Main Street takes preservation very seriously, and I was a preservationist before I was a Main Street. So there were, have been two major projects along these lines that Shaw Main Streets has undertaken. Uh, the first was uh, to create a series of photo montages uh, of the buildings on every block in our service area on the Seven Nine Streets back in 2004, which we use as a baseline. And then uh, periodically we take photographs of uh, blocks that have had uh, development activity take place uh, so that we can show the then and now. And then uh, several times over the past 20 years, uh, we've uh, gone out and taken photographs of, uh, to uh, parallel historic images uh, from the neighborhood uh, so that we could show uh, you know, how buildings have been successfully integrated into a new development and in some cases, you know, what we've lost. So uh, uh, this version uh, is uh, the latest one uh, and uh, has been updated. Uh, thanks to a grant uh, from the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. So we're going to uh, let's see, having a, a bit of a glitch with the uh, cursor, for which I apologize. I don't know what's causing that. Let's see. Um, maybe you can try uh, the arrows on your keyboard. That's what I'm using. Oh, okay. And we just tested it a minute ago. Mm -hmm. uh, let me try to uh, okay, reboot it. Sorry about that. Let's no, it's okay. Get out of it. Oh, 
hopefully it didn't crash. Maybe not. Um, okay. Let's try it again. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's technology. It's fine. It's just things yeah, that will do it to you. <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that. So we'll start at Mount Vernon Square, uh, which is uh, the southern end of our service area. So we're going to take a virtual walk up uh, 7th Street uh, with some detours onto 6th and 8th, all the way up to the Florida Avenue. And then we'll, we'll uh, be magically transported down to uh, 9th and K, and we'll go up uh, 9th Street. Uh, so uh, it's almost as if we were taking a t uh, physical tour, except uh, that we don't have to deal with uh, the 90 plus uh, degree heat that we had today. So um, some of the images that uh, we're gonna be seeing today uh, come from uh, the, the Weimar collection at the uh, Historical Society, now the uh, UC History Center. And uh, this is one of those, and it's uh, the Carnegie Library, which was completed in 1903. And then uh, this is a 2004 image on the bottom taken uh, from the same perspective. Now, uh, you'll notice that most of the photographs uh, have been taken with the intention of getting as close as possible to the perspective of, of the original images. Uh, so if you're wondering why some of the angles and shots might not be uh, as polished as you would expect, uh, we're intentionally trying to, uh, to replicate uh, what the original photographer saw. And then this is directly across the street. Uh, uh, this is where today uh, we have um, uh, the, uh, the Renaissance Hotel, uh, but uh, back in the day, this is in 1950, uh, uh, in the middle of the block, you have uh, the Hippodrome Theater, uh, which was the original location of the arena stage. These buildings uh, were all uh, demolished uh, you know, for uh, new construction uh, when the Tech World Complex uh, was developed. And then this is also across the street from uh, the Carnegie uh, Library. Uh, this is uh, you know, the, the row, of, actually, yeah, it's the same block, except closer to, uh, to 8th Street, showing uh, the mix of types of buildings that uh, were present uh, before uh, the redevelopment uh, of the area. So uh, this is a recurring theme. Uh, we have a number of blocks that we'll be looking at, and uh, you'll, be, you'll see the, the familiar types of one and two and three-story uh, buildings that are common. On other commercial corridors uh, where they've survived, and we have a couple of intact lots, uh, but unfortunately we did lose many of them in Shaw. So this is on the other side of, of 8th Street. Uh, this is also a view of Tech World uh, today, uh, but uh, back in the day you can see before uh, there was a high-rise, and you can see the tower of uh, the Marlow Furniture Building, or at least that's what most people call it, uh, in the distance uh, there a block away. And here we are at, uh, at 7th and Massachusetts, uh, and uh, obviously a very prominent corner, uh, which has uh, had uh, some uh, very uh, dominant buildings on it. Uh, in the past, you can see uh, an original People's Drugstore. It was People's Drugstore number one, which is a view from 1910. And then uh, today, uh, you can see the the, was, uh, uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And then across the street on the uh, north side of Massachusetts Avenue, uh, you see uh, the, the Provident Bank building in the historic uh, photograph. And interestingly enough, uh, for many years, there, there continued to be a bank location in this building, even though even after uh, the site was redeveloped, uh, the anchor tenant uh, back in 2009 was uh, NPR before they moved to North Capitol Street. Uh, but today, uh, a law firm is the anchor tenant to the new building, uh, which incorporates all of the space on the block. Uh, the previous building did not. And then directly across K Street, uh, this is one, one of my favorite uh, shots uh, from uh, this presentation, uh, because in the foreground of both of these photographs, you can see the historic cast iron fence uh, that uh, surrounds a small pocket park. Uh, at uh, the intersection of, of New York K and 7th Street. Uh, but in the historic photograph, you see the types of buildings uh, that were present on the footprint of the Washington Convention Center uh, before the 1968 riots and before uh, the uh, construction of uh, the center. So the, the view from 2004 
uh, shows that uh, the only thing that has survived in this particular shot is the fence. On the footprint of the convention center, uh, we had you know, a vast variety of different types of buildings, and two, including two churches. Uh, so this view of one of the historic churches uh, is approximately uh, where uh, the, the entrance of the convention center uh, is today. And then back on 7th Street, uh, looking up at, on the east side of the street, a thousand block, this is one of the most intact blocks of uh, commercial uh, buildings that we have left in Shaw. Uh, there's uh, only one building uh, that is now uh, an infill building, uh, but everything on this, uh, on this block uh, is original. Uh, most of the buildings are owned by Douglas Development, uh, who has uh, uh, tender loving care into restoring them and incorporating them into a new development uh, named 655. New York Avenue, uh, which you can now see looming over uh, the historic buildings in, uh, in the row that has been uh, preserved. Uh, you can see in the photograph, uh, in the historic photograph, uh, that uh, for many years there, there was a notorious liquor store uh, in that corner space, uh, which uh, later became the, the first home of uh, the Arnold Night Festival back in 2001. And the Shalom Baranis Associates are responsible for uh, of the uh, new development at 655. Uh, this is a, a photograph on the left uh, from uh, the Historic American Building Survey, uh, you know, um, often uh, has uh, documents, buildings before they're demolished. And uh, thankfully, uh, you know, this uh, uh, you know, wonderfully detailed uh, cornice has survived uh, from the Isaac Levy and, and some uh, building. And now uh, uh, we do have uh, its, uh, its neighbor, uh, which was owned by uh, the, the Ruger family. Uh, here is a, a, a circa 1920 uh, photograph. The gentleman in the doorway is uh, the, uh, the ancestor of the Rupert family, uh, who after uh, many generations of owning property on this block, uh, sold their property to Douglas Development uh, for incorporation into 65 New York Avenue. They operated the, the warehouse uh, theater cafe uh, in what used to be the hardware store space. And then uh, it's currently a uh, vacant retail space uh, uh, waiting uh, to be leased. Uh, but you can see that it has been lovingly restored along with the rest of the room. And uh, with the very sensitively uh, added uh, ribbons of glass above for the, the office building uh, as part of the complex. Uh, another view uh, from the, the HABS documentation of the block uh, in the 1970s, it was thought that uh, this would would be one of those blocks that was demolished, uh, like everything that was across the street uh, where the convention center is today. But uh, unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen. And another view uh, where, uh, where you can see some of the K Street buildings uh, looming uh, in the background uh, from this perspective. Again, there was still a hardware store uh, all those many decades later in the space that uh, was owned by the group. So now we're looking at the other side of the street on the 1000 block and uh, you can see the, the lively uh, mix of, of small independent businesses, uh, many of them uh, owned and serving uh, African Americans uh, that um, occupied uh, you know, most of this part of the country uh, in the decades uh, before the 1968 riots. And uh, all of this uh, space uh, was cleared uh, in anticipation of the development of a uh, campus for the University of the District of Columbia uh, that never happened uh, when it was originally proposed in the 1970s as part of River Renewal, and then subsequently the Washington Convention Center was built on the site. Another one of the churches this, uh, that was on the site of the Convention Center, this is uh, St. Sophia, um, uh, Greek Orthodox Church is now up on Massachusetts Avenue, but this is, was, was their original location uh, right near the L Street entrance uh, Eighth and L Street entrance to the convention center today. And then uh, back to 7th Street. Uh, uh, this is another pre-1968 photograph at the upper left. And uh, you can see that uh, there were three-story buildings and one-story buildings uh, intermixed. Uh, in many cases, the owner of the business would live above uh, the storefront uh, with uh, his or her family. Uh, it was a traditional pattern of development. And uh, obviously all that was lost uh, in the riots and uh, replaced by another part of uh, the Washington Convention Center. And here we have a view of that same block 
from the rights in April of 1968 following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Devastated uh, 7th Street and many other uh, commercial corridors around the city. Uh, you can see uh, National Guardsmen uh, conducting traffic uh, and uh, also uh, maintaining order um, uh, after the, the rioting uh, was over. Uh, you can see the, the current uh, convention center, another view uh, of unfortunately of the rioting taking place in April of 1968. Uh, people did uh, take advantage of the opportunity to uh, enrich themselves uh, uh, with uh, the, the merchandise uh, from all of those uh, stores uh, that were looted and many of the stores were also burned. Another close up of uh, some of the uh, independent businesses uh, that characterized uh, this part of 7th Street. Uh, decisions were made uh, in the design of the convention center uh, not to put retail on, on this portion of the convention center, but uh, uh, there is uh, some significant uh, retail on, on the 9th Street side of the building. And then this is directly across the street. Uh, today, uh, this is the series of, uh, of uh, garden uh, apartments uh, with uh, ground floor retail is owned by United House of Prayer for All People. We'll be seeing their uh, main church in a few moments. Uh, but again, uh, the, the typical fabric uh, of the neighborhood uh, that you saw beginning in Mumford Square continued along 7th Street. And you actually uh, see the streetcar uh, rails running down uh, the middle of this block of 7th Street. We had a series of theaters, uh, small independent theaters, many of them uh, serving uh, African-American audiences or mixed audiences. And this instance, the gem, uh, I really love this photograph uh, almost as much uh, for the, the photograph of the car uh, that's in it uh, as I, I do uh, for uh, the wonderful facade uh, of the theater. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the theater and uh, the other uh, buildings on the block uh, were demolished for the construction of uh, the United House of Prayer Complex uh, that is here today. And another view looking south towards uh, the same block. Uh, now, so this is today the, the entrance to the, the Shaw High, the, uh, the Mumford and Square Convention Center uh, Metro Station at, at N Street and 7th. And uh, you can see uh, the uh, very uh, dense uh, variety of buildings uh, that uh, were located there uh, in 1950 uh, when the historic photograph was taken. So now we're dodging over a block to uh, the 600 block of M Street, uh, where uh, the United House of Prayer for All People uh, uh, built uh, their uh, main sanctuary, uh, God's White House. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that uh, 1960 building uh, replaced a wonderful uh, second empire mansion, uh, which is uh, still in the photograph in 1950. Uh, Danny Grace, uh, the founder of uh, United House of Prayer actually uh, did live uh, for a time in the, the mansion, and the mansion was also used for religious services by the church. Another view of, of a rather substantial mansion uh, on that uh, northwest corner of 6 and M Streets, northwest. And uh, back on uh, 7th Street, so today we have uh, a series of uh, garden apartments known as Washington Apartments uh, that uh, replaced uh, the historic fabric there before. Uh, and you can see uh, that the second building in in the historic photograph was uh, the Alamo uh, Theater, again, one of a series of small theaters uh, that uh, were located uh, throughout 7th and 9th Streets in Shaw, uh, which was often referred to as Mid City because it connected uh, downtown to the U Street area, which was referred to as Uptown. 7th uh, and 9th Streets were also sometimes referred to as the main stem uh, for the same reason. And uh, here, a wonderful color slide from the press collection uh, from the DC History Center uh, from 1966, uh, just before the riots, uh, showing uh, the, the mix of uh, delicatessens and meat markets and, and theaters and haberdashers and clothing stores that, that characterized the retail uh, that uh, still was active in the area. Uh, you'll notice that the streetcar rails are no longer visible in the historic photograph because the streetcar service ended uh, by 1962 and uh, uh, was replaced uh, by bus service instead. Another great view of uh, the entrance of the Alamo Theater, uh, another slide from the press collection, and uh, uh, the entrance to uh, some of the 
uh, buildings uh, in the Washington Apartments complex. And uh, here we have uh, the Mid-City uh, Theater. One of the stories that we've heard from uh, many of the elders in the neighborhood uh, was that uh, some of the theaters, uh, in order to be able to serve mixed audiences, would actually uh, put a sheet down the middle of the theater, uh, in the middle of the orchestra, and Black audiences would be separated by white audiences by the sheet. And uh, kids uh, uh, at the time would throw candy, pennies and, and other objects over, uh, over the sheet. Uh, some of the oral history that we got uh, from uh, some of our elders. So another view uh, of another part uh, of the block. And now looking back towards across 7th Street. So one of the longest survivors uh, in Shaw is, uh, <clears throat> is this church at 8th and N Streets uh, Northwest, uh, which was built in uh, the Abraham Lincoln administration. So uh, uh, Immaculate Conception uh, you know, uh, had its tower added at the uh, turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was originally a parish, excuse me, a, um, a, a spin-off church uh, from uh, St. Patrick's downtown because Shaw was just too far for people to go to services all the way down uh, to uh, St. Patrick's. Uh, the church also uh, built uh, additional buildings for schools and convents and, uh, and a rectory, uh, all of which are uh, on the National Register today. And another view of uh, the church, uh, and also including one of the uh, historic uh, commercial buildings that managed to survive on 7th Street. Uh, that's the old 7th Street Bank there. Uh, it's uh, visible in both photographs at the lower right. And then turning the corner and going up towards uh, the O Street Market, which is a major landmark uh, in the neighborhood, uh, you can see, uh, once again, the, the type of commercial fabric uh, that uh, predominated uh, in the area. You can see the streetcar rails are running down the street, and you can see uh, uh, the O Street Market. And then in the, in the 2004 photograph, you see the O Street Market without its roof. So you see the tower, uh, but unfortunately, the roof was lost in a severe snowstorm in 2003. Uh, and uh, it was the better part of a decade uh, before uh, the uh, project that uh, brought the roof back that was able to move forward. So looking back on uh, the other side of the street, the 1300 block on the east side, uh, and that, uh, that rich uh, you know, uh, uh, commercial fabric uh, from the late uh, 19th century, uh, all has been uh, replaced by this large apartment building uh, known as Gibson Plaza. Um, we developed uh, as part of urban renewal in the neighborhood uh, by uh, another one of the churches, First Rising Mount Zion. Uh, most of the, the uh, apartment buildings uh, along 7th Street were actually built uh, by churches using uh, federal funds uh, from the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the 1970s and early 1980s. So here we are on uh, the 14th block of 6th Street and uh, we see uh, the uh, typical uh, three-story uh, block uh, row houses, uh, which in 1950 were still in place, uh, but uh, uh, were demolished uh, uh, shortly thereafter to uh, create a parking lot uh, for uh, public school uh, buses uh, and other uh, public vehicles. Uh, today, it's uh, the playing field uh, and uh, the barbecue grove for uh, the Kennedy Playground. And uh, the, the building that's partially obscured uh, by a tree in the historic photograph is Washington DC's original high school. There was only one high school in the city folks uh, when uh, Washington High School was built. Uh, later, an Eastern High School, and a Western High School, and a Central uh, High School uh, were, were built. Uh, but this uh, was at one point labeled Central High School and had a, a number of notable uh, graduates, including uh, J. Edgar Hoover of uh, FBI fame. Uh, it later became a, a vocational school, uh, Alexander Graham Bell uh, Vocational School, and then later uh, was demolished uh, for the uh, parking purposes that I mentioned uh, before it became part of the, the Kennedy Playground. Uh, in 1964, one of the first uh, tributes to the slain president. Here's another view of the O Street facade 
out of uh, the original Washington High School, uh, later uh, Central High School. And you can see part of the uh, current Kennedy Recreation Center building uh, at the lower left. And here we are at the O Street Market. So it really is smack dab in the center of Shaw. Uh, Shaw was uh, originally named in 1966. So when the attendance boundaries of Shaw Junior High School, uh, building we'll see in a few minutes, uh, were used to uh, define an urban rural area. So just like Adams Morgan uh, was the result of two uh, schools, uh, um, Attendance boundaries being combined to form an urban renewal area. Uh, this one used the, the Shaw Junior High School uh, boundary. And uh, when this photograph was taken in 1974, uh, renovation work was uh, being conducted on uh, the park to, to be able to, uh, to put it back into productive use. You'll notice that the shed surrounding uh, the market, uh, which originally covered uh, additional vendors, uh, was subsequently uh, removed. And then here's a, a view again of of the O Street Market without uh, its roof uh, as a result of that uh, snowstorm that I mentioned earlier. And then here's the same view uh, uh, with a slightly water in the foreground and, uh, and a new lamppost, but again, uh, trying to recreate the same positions. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, the additional uh, construction that has been added to uh, the O Street Market to create what is now known as City Market as O. At o. And so City Market at O uh, is a mixed use, uh, award-winning uh, mixed use uh, development that occupies both uh, the square blocks uh, bounded by uh, 7th, 9th, uh, O and P Streets Northwest. Uh, another uh, historic view from across the street of the market while it still had its roof and then without it. And then uh, today, a uh, much better view uh, of uh, the overall complex, which includes affordable senior housing, 96 units of housing uh, for senior citizens that were included in the complex. There's also a, a 200 uh, room hotel in addition to uh, 600 uh, units of uh, market rate housing and a giant food store in the old market building. There were two schools that were uh, actually built on uh, uh, the site of uh, the of Kennedy Playground uh, today. And uh, this is the, the Polk School in the historic photograph, uh, which had a health clinic. Uh, that uh, was used uh, after it was no longer part of, of the public school system. Uh, and then that was uh, demolished as previously mentioned. And then today you can see uh, the uh, tower of the O Street Market uh, in the background uh, behind the new uh, Kennedy Playground. That was a view from Marion and uh, P Streets. Uh, the historic building in uh, the building, uh, in the photograph at the left uh, was known as the uh, Tyson House. Uh, which was a hotel which was used by farmers bringing their produce into a uh, market, whether it was the center market or the Hill Street market. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, subsequently, uh, in the 20th century, it became a, a Black Salvation Army building and uh, it was lost in uh, the 1968 riots and it has been a vacant lot ever since. Uh, there was a pocket park uh, that occupied it for part of the 1970s. Uh, but uh, most recently, uh, it has been acquired uh, for redevelopment and there will be uh, a new building arising there in the next couple of years. It will be a mixed use building. And then a block away, another one of the scars from the 1968 riots is this empty parking lot, uh, which subsequently has been uh, redeveloped uh, with an infill uh, building after the establishment of the historic district uh, so that uh, it is in character. Uh, uh, with uh, the contributing buildings uh, to the district. And this is uh, one of my favorite photographs uh, from, from, uh, from all the historic photographs that the Shaw neighborhood shows. Uh, the east side of the 1500 block of uh, 7th Street uh, back uh, in the late 1940s. Uh, you can see one of the islands uh, where passengers got on and off uh, the, the streetcars uh, and uh, the fantastic uh, you know, Broadway theater. Uh, which unfortunately uh, was uh, lost as a result of, of urban renewal. Uh, it was, uh, it's actually survived the 1968 riots and it was, but it was felt by the, the owner that it would be easier to redevelop if the lot was cleared. And no development proceeded there uh, for, for many decades afterwards. Uh, the, the historic building that survives next to the site of the Broadway Theater um, is a former uh, lumber yard. Uh, which uh, 
uh, is notable because it's uh, currently home to Redfern City. Uh, the architect, uh, John Williamson, uh, redeveloped uh, the, the building for uh, that health clinic uh, using a lot of exposed lumber inside in tribute to its previous use. And then this is the, the extension to uh, Berkman City, uh, which was uh, in the past decade. Uh, one of the things that I had suggested as an ANC commissioner to the architects uh, that they tried to bring uh, some element uh, related to uh, the, the marquee of the theater. And uh, you'll see that uh, indeed uh, they did add uh, a punched metal screen uh, just sharing a couple more images uh, of uh, the theater uh, over time. Uh, well, what a loss. Uh, we would love to have had this uh, be another uh, wonderful uh, part of the community, just like the, the Howard Theater and the Lincoln Theater. But um, alas, uh, what we have today instead, uh, you can see the bread for the city is actually spelled out, spelled out in a punched metal screen uh, that is intended to be an homage uh, to of the fact that uh, the site uh, once held uh, this theater, which uh, uh, served African American audience. And then directly across the street, uh, we had uh, for a number of decades uh, a series of, uh, of two story garden apartment buildings known as Kelsey Gardens. Uh, they were all affordable, they were built uh, by uh, another one of the churches here in the district and they replaced uh, the fabric that was lost in the fires of the 1968 fires. Uh, and now those have been in turn uh, replaced uh, by uh, development uh, known as Jefferson Marketplace. Uh, it's a mixed use. Uh, Kelsey Gardens had uh, 54 units of housing. There were 281 apartments uh, in uh, the replacement uh, and uh, a wonderful um, use of uh, the retail spaces uh, by uh, some uh, very dynamic and diverse uh, establishments on this block. Other blocks uh, you'll notice along 7th Street uh, have no retail. Uh, when uh, urban renewal uh, set in, uh, the decision was made to not include retail, which has resulted in some significant, significant gaps in the retail fabric, uh, primarily along 7th Street. And here we are at 8th and Q and another survivor. Uh, this was originally uh, the uh, Inlachic Conception uh, Girls School, uh, which uh, was uh, managed by uh, the church that we saw uh, two blocks away. Uh, and uh, longtime residents remember the, the uh, students in their uniforms being marched back and forth to the church uh, from of this building, which continued to be owned by the Roman Catholic Church after it was no longer a school. It was Fide's house, it was a mission house, and then today is uh, the Ujama Shuli and Afrocentric School. So uh, back to 7th Street, looking back on that block where Kelsey Gardens uh, was located. And then here we have uh, what was originally built as uh, McKinley Technical High School. You're thinking, well, McKinley's over in Ward 5. Well, originally it was here at 7th and Rhode Island Avenue. Uh, it was originally a much smaller school, uh, but it became so popular that it was expanded. It was designed by the same architect uh, that created uh, the Gothic Revival buildings on the University of Chicago campus. It is now an individual landmark on the National Register and the DC Inventory of the Historic Sites. But in 1928, uh, when the new McKinley, or the current McKinley High School, was completed, uh, the, the school was turned over to the African-American uh, school system, the colored segregated school system, and it became Shaw Junior High School. And so therefore, this is the building that gave the neighborhood its name. Today, it is Asbury Dwellings. Uh, those are affordable uh, apartments for senior citizens. And the complex is owned by Asbury Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, we talked about uh, the high schools in the area. This was another of the high schools. Uh, this was uh, the original Cardozo High School. It was the business high school for black students. Uh, at one time, there were three shifts of students uh, being run through the school. It was so popular. Uh, and eventually, uh, this uh, school was transferred uh, to the former Central High School building at 13th and Clifton Streets, which is the current Cardozo. It was then uh, torn down and uh, temporarily used uh, for another parking lot uh, for uh, public purposes, and then subsequently it was redeveloped as housing uh, by 
uh, New Bethel Baptist Church, uh, which we'll uh, see in, in a few moments. And uh, so here's another view of, uh, of, of the front, this time of Cardozo students with uh, the class of 1941 outside, uh, sitting for their class picture, and then uh, the Foster House apartments uh, as they are currently. Those are all affordable apartments. So back up to 7th Street, uh, uh, this is the Wonder Bread Factory. Originally, uh, you know, it was a, a series of smaller uh, uh, bread bakeries, uh, but uh, there are still many neighborhood residents that, that remember the smell of fresh baked bread wafting through their windows in the morning. They didn't need an alarm clock. They knew what time it was based on the fact that they could smell the bread. Uh, Wonder Bread stopped uh, producing product at this location in the 1980s. It was vacant uh, for about two decades and then Douglas Development uh, expanded and renovated it into the, the complex that you see today. And then uh, you also in the background uh, see uh, the back of uh, the Progression Place development. Back on 7th Street, uh, the row of historic buildings that uh, was lost during uh, the riots uh, was replaced uh, with what was supposed to be a, a daycare uh, well, a, a 24 hour uh, center for seniors. Uh, 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 it was built by a nonprofit uh, who never had the necessary funds to be able to operate it. So, Howard University bought it, currently has offices there. Uh, we'll be redeveloping it in the near future. And then around the corner on the 18th block of 8th Street, uh, this is Cleveland Elementary School. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, there was a, a new a gymnasium wing that was built um, in this uh, century uh, to accompany the historic building that was restored. And here we are at the, at the corner of 7th and T, which uh, I like to call um, Washington's uh, Times Square, uh, because it was an integral part of uh, the, the Black Broadway. And with a number of theaters, including the Howard Theater, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, but this is a view back towards the 1800 block of 7th Street. And you can see uh, the uh, low rise buildings that survived the construction of Metro. Uh, other buildings were demolished on the block, but these are the ones that survived. And most of them uh, were incorporated into the new progression place development, uh, which as you can see has a retail on the ground floor. And then uh, the upper floors are a market rate and affordable housing. Another historic view of uh, the restaurant at the corner, and then you can see the Howard Theater uh, with its original facade uh, around the corner on the TV screen. Another view uh, of that corner with uh, some of the uh, current buildings looming above. And then here we have the, the Howard Theater, which uh, was the, the Carnegie Hall of uh, Washington's Black Broadway. Uh, it was opened in 1910 as the largest uh, theater for colored audiences in the world. Uh, although it was white owned, it was black operated. And uh, you know, um, the, um, the entire pantheon of African-American entertainment in the, uh, uh, the 20th century uh, played uh, at the Howard Theater, uh, which uh, had a modernization uh, to uh, more of a modern or art deco style uh, with stucco about 1940, uh, that's the facade that, uh, that remained uh, in the photograph at the, the lower right. And it closed uh, after the 1968 riots and opened sporadically in the following uh, uh, two decades until being closed finally for, uh, for about two decades. Uh, and then here we have uh, the Howard Theater today. Uh, we, because of the stucco that was applied to the facade, it was possible to remove that and recreate uh, many of the lost elements of the facade, but all the window and door openings are the originals that were able to be restored uh, by this project. And so the Howard Theater is uh, once again open, and now you can see the additional development that's taking place uh, immediately to the east. So this is a complex known as the Shaw, and uh, in front of the Shaw is a statue uh, entitled Encore, which is a tribute to Duke Ellington, uh, Washington DC. This one may come who often played at the uh, Howard Theater, but also that red uh, facade that we, was retained uh, in, uh, into the, the development of the Shaw was actually the home of a sign painting business that was owned by Dick Ellington uh, before uh, he achieved uh, fame as uh, a composer and entertainer. 
So uh, here we are at the, at the intersection of 7th and T. Uh, uh, this building uh, was developed in 1920 uh, by a Virginia-based uh, insurance company, an African-American insurance company. Uh, previously had a theater on the ground floor and uh, subsequently uh, today uh, has a bank. You can see that all except uh, for one empty lot uh, on that block uh, has survived. Uh, this is what the building looked like uh, before renovation. It stood vacant for many years because a nonprofit had, had acquired it for a dollar and they did not have uh, the funds to be able to renovate it. And then uh, Jefferson Builders uh, did an award-winning uh, restoration and uh, renovation of the building. It's apartments above the bank today. In another view of the condition of the, the building when I first saw it, when I first came to the neighborhood in, uh, in 1954. Uh, we just, just like uh, the Howard Theater, uh, we despaired of, uh, of this building ever being restored, but uh, now it, it's wonderful. Uh, stainless steel uh, marquee once again uh, gleams and uh, the uh, restoration of the uh, neon sign uh, was a major point in uh, the redevelopment of 7th Street. Uh, here we can see more damage from the 1968 riots. So the buildings in the background are still there, as you can see in a contemporary photograph uh, in the foreground, there's a CVS. And, in a build in a lot that's owned by Howard University and is due to be redeveloped uh, in the coming decade. So, and then you can see some of the new development in the back uh, called the Shea, not the Shaw, but the Shea, uh, uh, that uh, is rising uh, along East. So now we're, we're back down to uh, Montverde Square. Here we are at uh, 9th and K, uh, looking at 901 uh, K Street, uh, where the new Yardbird restaurant is located on the ground floor. But once upon a time, uh, all the trees were in the median, and now all the trees are on the sidewalk on the north side of the street. Uh, this is a view of uh, Mount Vernon Place Methodist Episcopal Church um, uh, from 1950, uh, and uh, very little has changed uh, here, except that uh, we do have unhoused tents uh, on the grounds uh, of the church. Um, today, but the, the church uh, was renovated as part of a redevelopment of their education building uh, to the west, and that's uh, you know, the, the glass building that lies behind them today. But the church has been fully restored. And here we have the Temple of Labor, the headquarters of the American Federation of Labor. This was Samuel Gomper's office. Uh, he had his own personal office on the top floor uh, of this building. Uh, when it was built, uh, 100,000 people labor union across the country came to march in the parade. Uh, you'll see that it uh, was one of the only survivors of uh, the 1968 riots and the, the clearing uh, of <clears throat> remaining buildings that took place uh, for new development. And it's been incorporated into the new Marriott Marquis Hotel. So, uh, so that was uh, an individual landmark that was incorporated into this entire square block development. Another view showing uh, part of the historic building and some of the um, surf fabric that was lost and uh, what uh, the block looked like uh, when uh, we were waiting uh, for the redevelopment and then uh, a view of the restored building uh, today uh, with another wing of the hotel. Here's some of the uh, commercial fabric uh, that was on the 9th Street side of uh, the footprint of the convention center. And you can see that uh, uh, there's no retail on this part. On the following block, uh, you can see the mix of, uh, of uh, late 19th century uh, commercial uh, buildings. And uh, uh, in 2009, uh, there was uh, already a loss of, uh, of two buildings uh, on that uh, facade. And today, that lot is still undeveloped. Uh, there have been a number of plans uh, to uh, redevelop it, but they have not come to pass. But you can see uh, the, the additions that have been and to the historic fabric uh, along to those buildings that are all now occupied by, by new retail restaurants, including restaurants on the Black and Alley side. And uh, we're at uh, 910 M Street. Uh, this was uh, the home of John Wesley Powell, uh, the, uh, one of the explorers of uh, the Grand Canyon and uh, uh, later uh, uh, the uh, director of the US uh, Geological Survey. Uh, this is where the Cosmos Club was founded, uh, in the parlor of 910 M Street Northwest. And although I, I lobbied very hard to try to get the developers of the new building on the site to name uh, the building uh, Powell, they named it the Whitman 
since they had these, they thought it was more marketable. You know, but uh, well, Winman did not live here, he lived nearby, but he did not uh, a particular site. Uh, but if you've ever seen the movie uh, Being There, uh, there's a site uh, where a number of gentlemen are warming their hands over uh, a barrel fire. Uh, that's the site of uh, Directly across the street, uh, you have uh, the home of uh, Blanche K. Bruce, uh, who was the first African-American uh, to serve a full term as a senator uh, in the United States Senate, uh, representing Mississippi. Uh, and uh, this is uh, his home, which is on the National Register uh, today, which is uh, a private home. Now we're inside Black and Alley. Uh, this 1920 photograph um, meant to show the, the decrepit conditions, the conditions of uh, the alley dwellings uh, back there. Uh, the alley dwellings were originally uh, servants' quarters uh, for uh, the houses that, uh, that face the principal streets. Uh, today, it's uh, one of the most loved places in Shaw because of the love mural by an artist, Lisa Marie Fallhammer. Uh, anytime you go by there, day or night, people are getting their pictures taken of the love mural. It is much loved. And it's part of the DC Alley Museum. If you've never been, been down there, there's about a dozen and a half murals on roll down on gates and on walls um, in Black Uh This uh, former Tally Ho Stables in Mailer Court, which is the alley system immediately to the north, of Black and Alley uh, is currently the home of the DC archives. But once upon a time, uh, the, uh, the water sprinkling, sprinkling trucks, uh, which were used uh, to hold down dust on our streets, uh, uh, kept here along the coast. And now we're up at, uh, at 9th and P Street. Uh, this is the side view of uh, Shiloh Baptist Church. Shiloh arrived in the 1920s. Uh, they had been relocated. Uh, from Fredericksburg, uh, Virginia, uh, during the Civil War, uh, located uh, originally uh, downtown and then uh, occupied another church at this site. Uh, the church has had two fires. Uh, the second uh, fire uh, lost uh, the original roof, but uh, nothing but the four walls remained. Uh, the church decided to once again rebuild and they continue to be an anchor to the community. And then around the corner, we have what we call Woodson Row. Uh, the Carji Woodson House uh, is the, the second house uh, from the right in each of these photographs. It is now uh, part of the National Park Service system as a, a home and offices of the father of Black history. Uh, but in 1979, these uh, Habs uh, uh, photographs were meant to document what uh, was feared might be lost in terms of our store fabric. Uh, the buildings were boarded up uh, for many years. Uh, and then uh, subsequently, uh, they now have been uh, restored. Uh, they're waiting uh, incorporation into the new development, except for uh, Woodson House and the two buildings in the north, which are a part of the National Park Service system. Another view from the 1970s of uh, the Woodson House and uh, 2009. Uh, the house was abandoned uh, for many years uh, by the association that Dr. Woodson formed and then uh, was eventually acquired by the National Park Service System and fully restored and can be visited today. You can see the original Associated Publishers signage on the front of, uh, of the building in the historic building. Another major landmark in the neighborhood is the Phillips Wheatley YWCA, originally part of the National uh, YWCA system uh, built for African-American women, uh, subsequently uh, independent and now no connection to the Y system, but it is a single room occupancy residence uh, for women uh, that recently has been rented. And uh, on the other end of the block, uh, uh, we had in the historic photograph, uh, the, the uh, residential buildings that, uh, that filled uh, that block of Rhode Island Avenue, uh, where subsequently uh, Cardozo Playground and Shaw Junior High School were built and where the current or the new Banneker Academic High School is currently under construction. In the current. And around the corner, uh, we have uh, one of the first all African-American firehouses in the city, uh, which uh, subsequently uh, was converted into housing. And there's also a neon art studio for young artists. And uh, here we have uh, another one of the anchor churches in the neighborhood. Uh, this is Lincoln, Lincoln Temple, Church, uh, which is currently vacant uh, for many, it was uh, an anchor church uh, for the Black Intelligentsia. Uh, and uh, this is the original church in the historic photograph, and they're returning to their 
their new church from the 1920s. Uh, currently, the Shaw Community Center operates from this facility. And here we have New Bethel Baptist Church, uh, which for 50 years uh, uh, had as its pastor uh, the first uh, DC delegate uh, to the United States Congress, uh, Walter Fontroy, uh, street on S Street, now named Walter Fontroy Plaza. Fortunately, uh, this historic building uh, was demolished as part of the Bourbon renewal uh, when this new church was supposed to be reminiscent of Noah's Ark was constructed. And uh, in addition to all of the new construction that happened uh, in uh, the, the Shoah neighborhood uh, during urban renewal, uh, there were also uh, improvements that were made in the community here. Uh, we have uh, you know, some of the handicap ramps and the new curbs that were installed as part of the Shaw School Urban Renewal Area Project. You can see the project signage uh, in the, the historic photograph. And uh, this is a block that is in the Greater U Street Historic District. There are actually uh, you know, uh, several historic districts that all uh, are part of our uh, Shaw Main Street District, including Mount Vernon Square uh, Historic District, uh, the Shaw Historic District, Greater U Street, and uh, the Black Mary Neal Court Historic District. And uh, we're going to wrap up at uh, the corner of 9th and U, uh, the entrance of the, the U Street corridor, uh, with uh, a series of historic photographs that were taken from the second story window of what is today Nelly's Sports Bar, which you may have heard in the news recently. But before it was Nelly's Sports Bar, it was home to the Skurlock family of photographers. They were the noted photographers of African American life in, uh, in most of uh, the 20th century. Uh, so if you were uh, you know, graduating from school, or if you were someone notable, or you were having a wedding, or some kind of a fraternal uh, event, you would always have a Spurlock photographer, photographers take your photographs. But here you have uh, a member of the Spurlock photograph taking pictures outside of the window of their home and studios across the street, and you can see the looters looting uh, the record store uh, that, you, that uh, is directly across the street, a block away. Uh, toward the upper right, uh, you can see uh, what is the name of the 930 Club. And uh, for decades later, uh, this building uh, was boarded up, as you can see from the photograph uh, below. This is a view across the intersection uh, of the riots, and you can already see uh, you know, police and National Guardsmen trying to uh, restore order uh, in the area. And you can see that part of uh, the block uh, has been preserved uh, while some of it was removed. Uh, or uh, a modern office building owned by the DC Housing Finance Agency, which is about to be redeveloped. And here's a, a great scene uh, of a Jeep uh, filled uh, with National Guardsmen uh, on patrol during uh, the 1968 riots. Uh, and then a view of, of that building that is today the Brixton uh, corner building, a uh, very popular uh, bar. And this is uh, the view of the, of the Brixton today. And uh, this is the point, if we were actually doing a walking tour, where I would uh, thank you all for coming out. And uh, you would ask me where to go to have uh, lunch or dinner after the tour. Uh, you can go to showmanstreets.org for more information about uh, the uh, 320 uh, mostly independent businesses, mostly food and beverage and entertainment establishments uh, that are in the neighborhood. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, you've provided. Well, thank you so much, Alex. That was really amazing. Um, and I'm always a big fan of kind of seeing those like before and after or like past and present kind of photos side by side because you can really see how things have changed over time. Um, but it was also wonderful to see, you know, what is still historic, what is still, you know, standing and what has been utilized by the by the current uh, neighborhood, the community. So that was really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have a couple of minutes for any questions that folks might have. Um, here with us on Zoom or, or on Facebook Live. Okay, uh, so Lawrence has a question. Um, how difficult is it now to raise a historic building in Shaw? Well, ideally, you don't want to raise any historic buildings. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, you know, from time to time do have some buildings that are, that are uh, lost because uh, of their a loss of integrity, structural integrity. Even in some cases, uh, we've actually seen the Historic Preservation Review Board uh, order a developer to disassemble a carriage house uh, that was in, in bad condition and put it back together again 
so that it could be reincorporated. In some cases, some of our uh, buildings have been moved around uh, so that they could, uh, so that uh, new development could be facilitated. In some cases, building, entire buildings have been moved across the street uh, temporarily while garages were built. And, uh, and then these buildings were put back in. Uh, 655 New York Avenue is an example uh, where several of the buildings were moved around and, uh, and reincorporated. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we did have uh, a situation uh, just last week uh, where uh, uh, some historic fabric that was not included in the uh, Triangle Historic District, which is another historic district that intersects uh, into the Shaw Main Street uh, area, uh, was proposed to be uh, landmarked, uh, but the, the board uh, chose not to landmark. So, uh, no, no, ideally, historic fabric is being incorporated into new development. Uh, if, a, if a larger uh, development is, is proposed. And uh, the, it's one of the things that the DC does very well. If you go to other cities like New York, you just get you know, demolished and uh, you have no sense of what was there before here. Uh, you know, the preservation community, and especially through the leadership of the league, uh, has made sure that you know, in centuries to come, when, when people come to, go to Washington, you know, and people that live here will be able to, to know what these neighborhoods looked like in the past because you know, significant portions of the built environment have been preserved. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I was really excited to see those photographs where, you know, even if the facade of a building was saved and somehow incorporated, right, you still have that sense of, of history. So it was really wonderful to see. And I guess, yeah. you know, oh, sorry, go ahead now. Yeah, we try not to, you know, as preservationists, we, we try to discourage facadectomies. Uh, uh, once upon a time, that, that was all the rage. Uh, just keep the facade, but now generally, you know, a minimum of about 20 feet of, uh, of a historic building needs to be retained, if not you know, the building in its entirety. If there were later additions that were added to the building in the rear, then those often can be demolished, uh, you know, for the, the convenience of, of the new development. Uh, but, um, you know, it's rare that, that just the facade is retained. Uh, that was the case in, in the, the Shaw building that I mentioned, uh, that mm -hmm. building that housed uh, Duke Ellington's uh, sign painting shop, uh, but um, uh, that was not part of a historic district. So we did uh, work out a development uh, agreement uh, with the developer to retain that in another building that uh, housed a historic uh, restaurant and nightclub known as Cecilia's. That's, that's also part of that new development. So. Um, Again, we, we try not to just keep facades, but uh, sometimes uh, you know, that's part of the, the trade-off of, uh, of making sure that, that there's some semblance of, of what uh, you know, a block looked like before uh, when a redevelopment takes place. All right, absolutely. Um, so we haven't gotten any other questions, but that kind of made me think of a question. Could you talk more about um, yeah, like the role that Shaw Main Street has played. I mean, you talked about this kind of throughout your, your presentation, but just to give folks like more of an idea, you know, um, how you do interact with and kind of meet with developers or architects, like kind of giving us more information about like how you work with them to try to keep as much as you can of the historic nature of the neighborhood. So, so first of all, you know, many of the, the folks that are that, that come to us uh, for, for guidance are individual property owners of a single row house or building, um, you know, on the commercial corridors, uh, because they may not have realized that they were in a historic district. Uh, uh, they're supposed to receive documentation of that you know, when you buy property in the District of Columbia, but somehow it doesn't always happen. And some people are surprised. Oh, you mean I can't just tear this building down? Not really, yes, you just spend a million and a half dollars and you can't tear that building down. Uh, so uh, we then do work uh, you know, with um, you know, both uh, the HBO staff as well as, as uh, the applicants to, to try to come up with a, a development team that uh, will retain as much historic fabric as possible. Uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, we, we help introduce them to sources of funding uh, like preservation tax credits and new market tax credits. Uh, that are available to, uh, to help uh, support projects that are incorporating historic fabric. Now, when, uh, when a developer has assembled a number of buildings in a in historic district with the intention of creating a larger development, um, you know, that, that's a much more protracted process uh, because uh, you know, if, uh, 
you have a developer like Douglas Development that is committed to using every square inch that they can of mm -hmm. historic fabric uh, in their developments, uh, then uh, sometimes it can take years to get through the entitlement process. So uh, the building at, uh, at 875 N Street where Charmaine Creeks has its office incorporates an entire row of historic buildings on 9th Street. And it took two years of, of uh, hearings uh, between uh, the zoning, uh, the Board of Zoning Adjustment, and uh, the Historic Preservation Review Board, because this project was like a ping pong ball. It was mm -hmm. going back and forth and back and forth because the two boards could not you know, reconcile what they thought should happen with that project. So that doesn't happen as often anymore. Uh, we're talking about uh, the, the mid uh, uh, part of the last decade or the, or the first decade of, of the 21st century. Uh, but um, you know that can be a challenge and it can be a source of frustration. Uh, there are developers that want nothing to do with historic fabrics and historic fabric and historic districts, uh, but uh, then there are other developers that, that cherish the opportunity to create real value and something unique. Mm -hmm. You can, anyone can put up a new building, but it, it takes a special kind of developer to give the tender loving care to historic fabric uh, that's necessary in order to be able to come up uh, with, a, with a winning design. And in so many cases, the staff of the Historic Preservation Review Board and, and uh, you know, our design committee at Shell Main Street have been able to really help the developer come up with a much better project than they came up with originally. So even, even the architects will, will begrudgingly grant that sometimes uh, you know, the, the process of dealing with the community and dealing uh, with uh, uh, the HBO actually you know, does come up uh, with award-winning projects. And we have a number of award winners. The neighborhood in this America is going to be nominating another one uh, hopefully will win uh, a design award uh, in this year's uh, design award. Uh, uh, preservation awards uh, that are uh, conducted by the DC Preservation. Yes, yes, please nominate them. <laughs> um, no, that sounds great. Um, yeah, no, that's that is wonderful when 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 those do work out, when they are successful, and when you are able to kind of you know have those um, that kind of like relationship with like developers. So it's great to hear. Um, we do have a question from Andrew in the chat. So any information on the house that was raised at the 16th block on the west side corner of 9th and R Street, uh, believed to have housed several black stars? So I believe what you're referring to, and I actually, you know, I, I didn't include uh, you know, that particular uh, set of photographs in, in this presentation just for time, uh, but I, I normally do. So I believe you're referring to uh, 901 R Street. Uh, which was uh, known as Lewis Thomas's Cabaret or the Clef Club, historically. It was one of the first places that Duke Ellington ever uh, you know, had a performance. It was a fantastic photograph that we also do show uh, in the presentations of uh, Duke Ellington uh, with his band and Brecktop, the notice Sean Tunes, uh, in the basement of the building uh, at uh, 901 R Street. So 901 R Street uh, was included in uh, the a pretty used to historic district, uh, so it had that protection, uh, but it uh, it had been abandoned and it, it was deteriorating. And uh, I had nominated it to be part of the African American Heritage Trail for the District of Columbia. I was one of the mayor's appointees uh, to that body, and it was accepted for that purpose. And unfortunately, some bricks fell off the chimney of the building, and two inspectors were dispatched. One was uh, from DCRA and said, this is dangerous, this building needs to be demolished. The HBO inspector said like, you don't need to demolish the building, you just need to take down the chimney. The, the property owner was very eager to redevelop the building with a new glass condo. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, which of those two opinions she decided to proceed with. So I received a phone call one Saturday morning uh, from the neighbors. I was uh, the ANC commissioner for the neighborhood at the time. Uh, and the, the panicked voice was telling me that there's, there was heavy equipment taking down 901 R Street. And I said, well, that's impossible. But I ran out there. And of course, you know, the, the, the demolition crew said, you know, we've got a, you know, an order here that says that you know, this building you know, needs to come down. I scrambled. I got in touch with, with the state historic preservation officer uh, who came out. I tried to reach out to the mayor's office 
uh, but they claimed, well, no, no, they've got a permit, so they're entitled to tear down this building. So I was able to reach out to the, the, the media and uh, we, on the news that night, everybody got to see 901 R Street demolished. This became such a, a cause celeb that the procedures that are now in place uh, to uh, make sure that uh, there was an evaluation mm -hmm. of buildings in historic districts or potentially eligible uh, for historic designation have to go through uh, review by HPO and HPRB before a raise can be approved. That was as a result of the loss of 901 R Street. What the great news is, if I had the photographs to show you, is that if Duke Ellington was standing across the street on that site today, he would not know that that building was not the building that he knew and claimed. Because mm -hmm. when that developer presented her plans, the community said no. And we went to HBO and HPRB and we said, we want you to build back what you tore down. And you know what HPRB said? Yes, build it the way that it was. So that uh, the developer had to actually pay for a crew to, to create, up, create detailed drawings by measuring the remaining buildings in the row. They were identical uh, buildings to the one that was demolished. And she ended up spending three times as much recreating that building as she would have if she had just renovated the original. So a cautionary tale. Uh, we were sorry to lose that historic building, but, uh, but again, if the Duke uh, was there today, he wouldn't know that it wasn't the building was lost. And, uh, and uh, a, a, uh, a pressed uh, brick a building with the name of the original development was salvaged uh, from the, the demoed bricks and incorporated into the facade of the building. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I think that is a perfect kind of story. I think that we can end it here today, but again, that. That is that is such a wonderful thing. Like, well, it's obviously sad that we lost the original, but to come out with these kind of like new regulations and stuff from that, I think is really important. The fact that they were made to recreate it and we could incorporate at least a piece of the original for, into, into it um, is, is very impactful. Um, but thank you so much, Alex, again, for you know taking us on this virtual stroll. Uh, hopefully folks today, they can go and um, maybe they'll go out for a walk today and, and take a look at the buildings that you had showed them today online um and i guess i guess kind of like a final question like i i we have the website here i put the website for straw main streets into the chat as well as the social media handle so you can go and follow them online um, but alex is there anything else that folks can be aware of that you're working on currently or any upcoming events or anything that you can share with us sure so uh, now that we're getting out of the pandemic and, and reopening uh I'm glad to be able to announce that Art All Night will be coming back on September the 25th this year, 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. the following morning. Uh, last uh, time that we had uh, the physical uh, festival back in 2019, we had 30,000 people come to the neighborhood. It's all wow. get to enjoy all kinds of uh, performances and visual art uh, uh, and even create uh, your own art. And it's all free. And uh, if you want to spend some money in, in some of our neighborhood bars and restaurants while you're here, you're welcome to do that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, uh, September the 25th, uh, starting at 7 p.m., uh, you can get information at our website and also at uh, Art All Night Shaw, excuse me, Art All Night DC Shaw dot or com. Uh, one more time, Art All Night DC Shaw dot com. Mm -hmm. And then also in October, uh, our, our uh, annual Eat, Drink, Shaw event. Uh, we'll be coming back to the, the Howard Theater. That's where we have about 25 different bars and restaurants uh, providing samples of what they do best. Uh, so it's a, a ticketed event, uh, but uh, you, you get uh, you know, several you know, hundred dollars worth of, of beverage uh, for uh, your $75 ticket. So yes, uh, watch for, for news uh, on, the, on that event. And if you haven't been to the Howard Theater, uh, inside the Howard Theater, it's a great opportunity to, to be able to, to check out the wonderful uh, you know, 21st century entertainment venue has been created within uh, the restored shell of the original. Oh, that's wonderful. So yeah, absolutely worth the ticket price. Um, but that is so exciting to hear. And I know I'm looking forward to those events and, and hopefully our folks here who have attended will go check, uh, go learn more about them on your website. Um, yes, thank you, Christina. Christina put the artallnightbcshaw.com into the chat so you can go learn more there. 
Um, thank you again, Alex, for this. And I'm so happy that you uh, were mentioning theaters because uh, funny enough, next month as part of our 50th anniversary, uh, July, we are highlighting historic theaters in the district. So I think this is like a really good transition into that month as well. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. We have some exciting events coming up uh, related to historic theaters in the district. Uh, you can learn more about that on our website or you know, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, but again, please, I encourage you to check out the Shaw Main Streets website, follow them on, online. And a uh, big thank you again to Alex. And thank you to uh, all of you as well for joining us today. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, a nice uh, holiday weekend, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon.